So first things first, how are you? Good, thank you. I'm a bit tired, but um, it's been a exciting and busy lead up to <laughs> broken hearts and and wrapping up all the loose ends of work for the end of the year. I can't even believe already that it is the end of the year so quickly. Yeah, weeks have been flying by for me as well. Um, thank you for taking the time at this hour. Uh, before we get into broken hearts, I would like to jump back a little, little bit to the beginning. Now you started playing music very early and having these kind of modes of expression. So so what was the first kind of impetus to do so? What, what was the first motivation to kind of get these thoughts out in some creative way? I think that for me, it's always been sort of subconscious need to express myself. I started playing violin when I was four okay. um, and I was performing and doing little concerts with my class, my violin class and everything and singing concerts and I was in musicals and really any opportunity to perform was really important to me, I think, for my my personality and, and just my mm. being. It was part of how I expressed who I am. And so then um, as I got a bit older, probably in my early teens, the idea of like – being able to write my own songs and write my own stories, especially writing those stories within the music, like the stuff that was resonating with me, I was like, oh, maybe I could do this. Like I could write this. And that was really important um, in my growth, I think, as a as a teenager, especially it's so crazy. Like you're a kid and everything's easy and then you're a teenager and all of a sudden everything isn't easy. Right. <laughs> and, and for me, I had to get those emotions out because I feel everything very strongly and I'm quite passionate about my opinions, but um, that can also be a curse as much as it's a blessing mm. because you feel everything really strongly. And I found that music and writing songs was just a way that I could healthfully get those feelings out. Was there a song that you wrote maybe very early on, even before you thought about a career in music that, that had a big impact on you writing it and kind of getting through a certain time or emotion? Yeah, there was actually. Um, I can't remember what it's called. Hmm. I think it might have been called The Wall. No reference to Pink Floyd, but I think it <laughs> might have been called The Wall. But um I remember the song because I recorded it and then I re-recorded it and I posted it on like whatever the posting thing, band camp, I think it was. <laughs> um, and it was like a really dark song, really kind of confronting and the lyrics were really, really violently confronting. Okay. Um, but I was like, I feel great now. <laughs> and I think that was when I realized that music had this magical for me at least this magical way of allowing me to express maybe darker feelings and darker emotions in a safe way that mm. kept everything good rather than you know internalizing those things and it turning quite you know sour sure and at the same time were you already writing kind of short stories or, or bigger um because the song is ultimately it's, it's like three four minutes so you have to condense like the and shortest be, story yeah. so, so <laughs> um, writing something I like was. that and, and and those novels that you've written that, that's quite a difference so so how did you, how do you yeah. kind of well at a young age i i started writing stories before i started writing music okay. i was always playing music uh, other songs that I liked, but I didn't start writing my own music until I was about 13. And I was like, okay. oh, I'm going to, you know, start learning guitar. And when I was 14, I like kind of had some chords and I mm. started doing that then. But from when I was about eight or nine, I started writing short stories. And to me, the two um, creative mediums are very different and they always have been and they always will be. They're intrinsically part of my self expression, but I approach them very differently. Songwriting for me does not have a rule book. It is very organic. I do not psychoanalyze myself. <laughs> I do not say I'm writing a song about this and these are the three keywords and this is the, like, I don't do that. I just literally write it and people ask like, how, how do you do it? Like, tell me your process. And I'm like, I just listen to the music and then I write the lyrics and I'm sorry that there's <laughs> no easier way or no clearer way for me to say that. It. It's just how I do it. 
Mm. And then sometimes I'll go back through and I'll reread them and I'll tighten the words and find better ways of saying things. But especially for that initial, like getting it out, there's no formula for me. There's no plan. Whereas when I write a book, I have notebooks with pages <laughs> of character profiles, their backstories, the outline, and it's very, um, it's a very like sort of cognitive activity. It's not the same free flowing. Like when I'm writing, if things take a random turn and all of a sudden I'm in a dark forest with my characters, I'm like, whatever, that's fun. <laughs> but before I start, I like to have a plan. I like to have a bit of a map. And I think that those two very different um, ways of working are confusing, I suppose. They're kind of confusing because it's like, well, how can one person have two such distinctly different sure. ways of working? But to me, writing music is about um, catharsis, personal catharsis. Mm -hmm. It allows me to like just like it did when I was 14, it still allows me to get out those bad feelings in a way that, is safe and healthy and productive and leaves me feeling much lighter. Whereas I write stories because I get excited by imagination and the possibility. So they're two kind of different mindsets. Do they ever overlap in a sense? And I, I, I haven't read your books, I have to admit, but um, I can imagine that some of the songs that you write kind of function as sort of soundtracks in the in, in, in the background of these worlds or these these uh, locations yes. that, that that you write about. So, uh, do they overlap? Do those two worlds overlap for you? Yes, they do, and particularly with the Selfless series and Volume One, Two, and Broken Hearts. Okay. Um, the sort of mindset I say is that the music is what the characters would be listening to mm. if they were listening to music in the world. And there's a song, like each of the songs has a scene that I imagine it's sort of okay. attaching to, whether it's soundtracking the scene or highlighting an emotional experience of one of the characters. That is something that I had in mind when I wrote the songs. Okay. It wasn't something I had in mind consciously like, okay, I'm going to put this word because it relates to that word. But when I was writing the books, I was doing that. I was like, I'm going to take a line from that lyric and, mm. and put it into the book. So it's kind of just comes back to that two different mindsets. It subconsciously goes into the music and then consciously is reinforced in the literary writing. And Interesting to me as the person that has created it, <laughs> um, I don't tell people which song goes to which scene because I have them in my head. Sure. But your interpretation of a song could be completely different. I could be like, wow, this is a really sad song. And to you, you're like, this is a really empowering <laughs> song. And I don't want um, my listeners or my fans to be kind of polluted by my relationship with my music and so if you listen to the music and you read the book you might have a completely different combination and that's really mm. exciting to me because that's when the art stops being mine exclusively and starts being everybody's yeah that, that's very interesting because especially uh, with uh, a book or a novel i suppose people have their own interpretations and and uh, obviously songs as well yeah. so so what is one of the um more outlandish uh, interpretations of, of something that you've created. Uh, what, what has that been? It's some, sometimes the backstories are pretty wild. Like I have a discord. It's a very vibrant community on discord <laughs> of my fans. And there's a, there's a channel in discord specifically for the book series and people like to put their theories in there. And sometimes the backstory theories or like the projection, like future theories, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I just know that when I do, <laughs> when I do look at them, sometimes there are some wild theories and I'm like, I would never have thought of that. <laughs> and it's definitely not where the story is going, but I appreciate the creativity. <laughs> No, but the, the, that's what I was going to get at because the, the people can online can be very creative, and I think for, for you, Definitely. one of the core kind of things is is uh, the ability to express yourself. So the, I, I assume you want to promote that in other people as well, kind of, or at least give them the the courage or the 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 strength to to pursue something like that. Hundred percent. It's so important. I'm a really big advocate for um, using creative production, not 
mm. music production, but the production of art in all its forms as a way to um, express oneself in a in a safe and healthy way. And I think that that is something that gets lost, especially in our online world. And I know that there are a lot of ways to be creative using technology. If it's like digital drawing or music production or videography, there's lots. I get that. But I think that there are so many other things with technology and the online world. And I don't think it's technology so much as it's the online side of the world that mm. so much time gets lost in these sort of black holes of scrolling that people <laughs> sure. are getting into these negative mindsets or not necessarily negative, but just not productive mindsets or not feeling like they can do it. Like people can sit on their phone and watch a TikTok for well, a stream of TikToks for hours of other people sure. doing stuff. And I, I just think to myself, like, why watch other people doing it when you could just do it? Like put on the music that you love, listen to my music and draw yourself. Don't watch a video of someone else drawing. <laughs> it's okay to get a bit of inspiration, but I think that the more people, even if it, they think that what they create is horrible and no one sees it, it's not about sharing it. It's about what it does for you and feeding your soul and giving you that calmness because even a little scribble, like a little doodle stick man scene, you know, it's, it's just therapeutic. Mm. So is, is that the ultimate motivation for you then? Why, why you kind of, because uh, I, I always talk about ambition with people as well, what, what they kind of try, because the industry, the music industry is, is a volatile thing. And yes. uh, so, so is that your ambition ultimately to just have that uh, space where you can express yourself in, 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 a, in a healthy manner, as you mentioned? Essentially, I feel for me, I would, create music regardless of if I had an audience okay. or not. I'm just blessed to have an audience. I mm. need to make music to be sane. It <laughs> is my sanity. And I make a lot of songs and I have a lot of songs ready for next year. And even the year after, like there's a lot of music creation that goes on and it's fun, but it's work and that's okay. And I think that there's this sort of like negative connotation between I don't like the do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life mindset because I think that that puts an unrealistic expectation because it is work. What I do Not is sure. work. I have to go on social media and that is work. I have to write songs and they have to be finished and they have to be up to a certain standard that I have for myself. It is work. I love it and I'm very lucky, but it's still work. And so for me, I treat it as such. And I mm. give it the respect that it deserves. I don't go, I don't feel like it and take a day off. Like that doesn't happen in my world. I'm okay. writing every single day. I'm writing a song at least one a week. There's so much that goes into doing this. And the fan response that I get is what makes me do it and makes mm. me so excited and, and sort of boys me in the like whenever I do have a day where I'm like I wish I could just take a day off I'm like no because you know there's someone on the other side of the world that is looking forward to this next song and I have the luxury of the ideas and the ability to create it so I'm just gonna do that and that's sort of where my mind is and that's where my mind goes I'm just always trying to think of the ways that I can sort of give experiences to my fans, whether that's last week or this, this week, it's this week's been a blur. This has been a busy week with the release, but like I did a discord Q and a, and that was a bit over an hour. And the fan response was awesome. People love like, so sure. I get a lot of the same questions that I've had in every Q and a, but people love hearing those things and there's always new fans. So they don't know the answer because they're new. Mm. They've just joined the community. And so that to kind of do an extended answer to your it's a very simple question, <laughs> I would say that's what drives me. But my my message on a whole is about using creativity to express yourself healthfully and to sort of fight negative thought patterns by getting them out rather than bottling them in. 
and and thematically i suppose that that is an element in your music as well so if we go into a couple of the songs a little bit closer then uh, for instance the 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 album title broken hearts it's a line in uh, nightmare i suppose watching hearts break still makes me laugh so <laughs> this this notion uh yeah when did that kind of pop into your head there is something perversely beautiful about cruelty. And I think that that's why humanity is so obsessed with like serial killer documentaries and understanding people that do these like horrible, horrible things and watching TV shows where people cheat on other people and do these horrible things that we're, we're all sitting there like, wow, this is so messed up. But if you par it back and, and get rid of the sort of extremeness there are little things that people do every day that are kind of selfish or unkind or thoughtless. And I think that it's part of the human process to to do those things and then to either choose to go, I don't want to do those things anymore mm. or to get trapped in that world and becoming that person essentially. And we all know people that are like that on sure. different areas of like different levels of extremity but the line broken heart still make me laugh makes me laugh um because i think that for me it means those people and i i've been like that in the past where you kind of close yourself off because you've been hurt and instead of letting people in and letting people hurt you again you go i don't care but you do care it's fake of course you care. We all care. Like you can say you don't care what other people think, but what you're actually saying is I'm choosing not to let what you think bother me or upset me or impact me. It still gets heard. It still gets processed. It still gets absorbed into you. It's how you choose to respond with it. And so the the line, broken hearts still make me laugh, this person, that version of the girl that's singing is saying, whatever. I don't care. Your pain makes me happy, but that's not actually the case. Sure. But is, is that where a song like uh, Lonely then kind of uh, comes from as well, where where this this um, kind of resilience uh, comes in, where you kind of have to go, well, no, I'm powerful enough to, to push through and to, to, to get to the other side? Exactly. That is exactly right. And broken hearts, and when people hear it, They'll be able to go, yeah, that's one version of protecting yourself. And then sure. lonely is another version. Lonely, you're feeling it. You're not feeling good. She's feeling really impacted, like trash, like literally mm. like trash. That's the lyric. But it's how we choose to move forward. Right. And the resilience is the thing that I I do harp on about this album. To me, there's a lack of resilience in society everyone is kind of ill-equipped for reality in a sense. <laughs> right. And I think that you have to be resilient because there's always going to be opposition. There will always be people that don't like you for no reason. Sure. There will always be things that are difficult and like hard to do. There will always be horrible things that happen that you don't expect from or to friends and family. That's part of being a human. It's part of living. That's our human experience. And we have to be resilient as individuals. And how we choose to react to situations defines that. And to me, this album is, is trying to show people that they have the power to be raw and be vulnerable and still triumph at the end of the day. Final question then, because this mentality that that uh, you talk about, it it's not easy to get there for everyone. So what made you kind of, uh, yeah, what, what what allowed you to be confident enough or to be vulnerable enough to to allow uh, that mindset to to take place or to set in in a way? I don't know if that's phrased <laughs> phrased right, but no, that makes sense. You're saying what. What was my journey to getting to that headspace? Yeah, because of the, I, I don't think it's easy for people. Like you say, the, uh, resilience is, is is a tricky thing, especially these days, because as you mentioned, the word ill-equipped, I think people these days with the pace that 
technology is moving and it's very difficult yeah. to keep up and our human emotions kind of don't gel that well i suppose with the with the online world so so to get to that place where you can kind of allow yourself to be vulnerable is, is quite valuable i think i think that for me i mean what you're saying is 100 correct it is really hard and almost insurmountable for some people and mm. It's so easy to just get caught in that thought spiral, the thought bubble of like, no, it's not possible or I'm not good enough or whatever sure. the thing may be. But all those people keep saying that, or like this person I'm working with keeps saying these horrible things or this kid at school like mm. keeps looking at me weird. Like it's so easy to get caught into that. But I remember this <laughs> When I was 16, we were on a school excursion and I had had a friendship breakup with a group that I had sat with at lunch. Mm. Generally, girls sit with groups at lunch and it can become quite bitchy. <laughs> um, <laughs> as you probably already have seen in movies and stuff, like it's not too yeah. far from the truth. And so we'd had this sort of friendship falling out and I drifted away and I had started talking to this other group. And on this excursion, I felt happier and I was only 16. But in that moment, I was like, I don't want to sit with people that make me feel bad because that makes no sense. Mm. And so that was the first moment that changed my perception for things. And that wasn't the moment that changed everything in my life. It's a gradual process that we're constantly going on. But sure. I always remember that moment as being this pivotal point in which I was like, I don't ha have to put up with being treated a way that I don't like. I don't owe that to anybody. I'm not being unkind. So I don't need to be unkind back. I just need to remove myself. Right. And I did that. And then as I got older, the more... I started to interact with different people. You know, you go to university, you're not in your little high school bubble anymore. The more I really saw different personalities. And once I started working in the music industry, it was really intense because people are really unkind and yeah. they don't care. And it's really cutthroat. Like you said, it's like very fast paced and people have certain expectations or certain personality traits. And sometimes you don't like that or they don't like you or your traits. And I didn't want to curtail to that and I didn't want to let people win, but not in a way like I'm better than them. I don't want them to win more in a, that person doesn't impact me. Like if, if I don't like them, I don't have to work with them again. Or if I don't like how they talk to other people, I don't have to include them within my circle anymore. Mm. And, those sorts of things will kind of what like just little moments where I was like, hey, just because somebody treats me badly doesn't mean I have to stop. Doesn't mean I have to treat them badly. Doesn't mean I have to feel sorry for myself. Doesn't mean it's me. It could be them. Mm. And and I guess it's just like building a habit of not taking on those sorts of things and then holding on to them. And I think that's the hardest thing because sure. – there are some things that you hold on to. Somebody says something and you just can't let it go. You read a comment and you just can't let it go. And anytime I notice myself doing that, I take a step back and I assess the situation. I'm like, why do I care? <laughs> like, do I care because I think it's funny? Do I care because I think it's hurtful? Do I care because I just don't understand why somebody would bother? And usually right. that's where I get hung up personally right. because I could never be bothered. But sometimes people yeah, well, take a lot of energy to try and put other people down and it literally blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, well, why would get, uh, anybody go so far out of their way to kind of be mean to somebody else? It, it still blows my mind as well. It's, it's I don't know. It's so <laughs> weird. It's so bizarre. So I guess that that's what, I mean, it really just makes you go, ah. Oh. <laughs> They must have a really bad life. They mustn't have any resilience because if they did, they, they probably would be doing other more important things like <laughs> anything else. <laughs> no, that, that's kind of, for me at least, how, how I kind of got to to uh, 
to let go a lot of that stuff this is kind of what we talked about earlier is once at a certain point you push through into comedy what once things get so weird and, and confusing it just becomes <laughs> funny in a way that like i said i i can laugh about something i can imagine something sitting behind the computer being really mean and like it's it's just so crazy to imagine that so so it becomes funny again for me at least i can't oh, take it seriously anymore no you can't even people in real life like I've been in songwriting sessions in LA with people and their behavior like these are adults <laughs> these are people in their 30s like they are right. well on the way to like adult life acting like 14 15 year old <laughs> children and I just look at these people and file all my thoughts away and then in the car I say everything that I think <laughs> all my opinions it's with people I just don't get it but that's I guess what defines us, how we react to situations and how we choose to let things impact us. And I don't want other people's crap impacting me. I've got literally too much to do. I have got a book to finish before Christmas. <laughs> I don't have time to be like feeling sorry for myself because one person on the internet doesn't like me. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's a very healthy attitude. So uh, very last thing then, you just mentioned that you're uh, trying to finish your book before Christmas. How is it going? <laughs> and, and, um, is it, is it in the same line? Are you, are you still continuing uh, the story? Well, there is the third book. So the first two books, Selfless and Relentless, are out. The third book, I have written the first draft, but okay. it's just to the side now because okay. when I finish, I need some space before I come back to edit it. Um, so I'm working on a new book for a whole new series. It's a okay. fantasy series. Um, and so I have been working on this book for ages because I made this stupid mistake of starting it before I had finished the edits <laughs> for Relentless, which was a big mistake because it ended up being a bit choppy. So it's taken me longer to finish the book than I had wanted, um, but I have the goal of finishing it before the 15th of December. So okay. <laughs> we'll see. I'm about three quarters of the way through. So you have a, a couple of interesting weeks to go. Uh, in a couple of days, the release of the album and then... Uh... Yes, and the album comes out on Friday and I'm so excited about it. I'm also a little bit excited for it to be out and then off my plate and on to the next one because I've already got all the artworks for next year's album and everything mm. is set to go. So I'm kind of... You know when like the music's been sitting there and you're just like ready for people to start listening to it? That's where I'm at now. One last thing, though, because I find this very interesting. Where do you get your work ethic from? Because it seems like you're really busy and you really like to be busy. I do. I, I work better when I'm busy. The busier I am, <laughs> the more I get done. And I still find time to read every day. And I like to mm. knit or do crafts. So I do a little bit of craft to try to do like 15 minutes at the very least every day. <laughs> um, but my work ethic, a little bit from Matthias, who kind of does everything with me in Aviva because sure. um, he's very hardworking and I'm very competitive. So if we're both <laughs> hardworking, then <laughs> we're on even keel. And also... You don't enjoy your free time if you've been slacking off. And I learned that again when I was about 16 because the teacher mm -hmm. at school had made some comment about the school holidays and finishing your assignments in the first week so you can enjoy the other five weeks. And at the time I was like, that's so dumb. Then I did it and it was amazing. It worked. So now I always have that in my head. So I try and get all my work finished so that I can have a few hours in the afternoon and the evening um, to read and to do some craft or maybe watch some TV, which I don't do very often. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's it's all about just doing it and not worrying about what you feel. And I think that's sort of my secret sauce. I don't worry <laughs> about if I don't feel like it. I just do it anyway. I, th I think that's very healthy advice for people as well to do, especially with things like getting up in the morning. Just don't think about it. Just get up. <laughs> I get up at five every morning okay. and go for a walk for an hour. And I can guarantee I never feel like it. <laughs> yeah. But once I'm walking, I feel great. And on the few mornings when I can't, because I have to go out or drive somewhere and I don't have time, it really puts a, a negative spin on my day. Like I just feel sluggish all day. Mm -hmm. That's so, interesting yeah. uh, to hear and uh, uh, very interesting <laughs> to talk to you. So Aviva, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me uh, this no, evening. No, thank you. <laughs> you've had some great questions. It's been wonderful. I hope that you've had a good chat. <laughs>